Your history, something tells me that you're being kind because um, <laughs> looking at Dorothy's publication record and lis just listening to her speak about the places around the world that she's traveled and conferences she's been invited to, um, I'm even more fortunate now to, or feeling more fortunate that she's here with us today. Um, Dorothy uh, has a, her bachelor's degree in biological sciences from Stanford University and has both her master's and PhD in zoology from the University of California at Berkeley. In addition to this impressive resume, uh, Dorothy has used her education to publish over 140, I'm told, it's been 140 for 10, 15 years now, so the number <laughs> has crept up um, since then, I'm sure, of publications um, that range in audiences from the young uh, to the, the uh, well-versed in science. She's brought a number of these with her, so uh, my shameless pitch, if you guys are looking for holiday gifts, we've got them here. Um, but otherwise, she has a diverse knowledge in the sciences and the human-animal relationship. A lot of her books focus on um, dogs and human-animal interactions, as well as sciences such as um, the ecology of fire. So we're thrilled to have her here. She just got back from a trip from the Outback studying uh, the Tasmanian devil. And um, not only does she have lots of exciting information, but brilliant pictures, too. So. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's great to be here. And do I, do I, or is anybody here a um, classroom teacher? Have some classroom teachers? I just want to let you know something that uh, doesn't relate to my, my talk at all. But there's a, I belong to an organization of nonfiction writers for kids. And we have something called the Nonfiction Minute. Actually, it's a play. Anybody who wants to learn cool little factoids about, about nonfiction, um, it's a free blog on the internet. And uh, every day, school day, there's a different, no more than 400 word tidbit of nonfiction and, uh, information from a, a well-known children's nonfiction writer, a whole bunch of us, about 25 of us involved. And so you just go to the non nonfictionminute.com and different one appears every day. And there's a back, I think there's a, uh, they can also go to the, um, whatever you call it. You can look at other ones, too. <laughs> Already. I keep trying to get my internet vocabulary okay. sometimes. So these cards here your cards. are about the show, telling you about the Nonfiction Minute and also about our organization on the other side. But the Nonfiction Minute is totally free. So yeah. and a lot of, we've had oh, hundreds of thousands of views over time now of our, of our minutes. People love it. And teachers like to use it like at the beginning of the day or they're shuffling their papers and doing the roll or whatever, you know. So anyway, so that's a separate thing. But I'm here to share, you, share with you about my writing and about the whole the business of, um, of nonfiction writing for kids. I mean, what, what does that mean? Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of books out there and, and lots of different um, um, publishers and so forth, but writing books for, for science about kids. They can be written for just about any age level, as you can see from, from my first slide here. Um, Dogs on Board is not actually a science book, but it's, um, I put it up there because it just came out. <laughs> and it's a really fun story about a dog in Seattle who, who uh, figured out how to ride the bus to the uh, dog park all by herself, and she got, became a, uh, an internet uh, YouTube star in the process. So, so that's, that's uh, but I do a lot of books at that age level, and uh, the books I have here for sale, a lot of them are for, are for that for little kids, for little kids. So um, they can be for, for young children. You can have a book that um, is readable for uh, older kids. So there's a Canvas and Sage over there on the other side. That's a book that's actually for the whole family. Uh, Super Sniffers is for like ages eight to 12. And uh, Call of the Osprey is for kids um, about 10 and up. And I have in the very top middle, a creature, not a book. <laughs> That's the Tasmanian Devil, and um, actually, um, <coughs> where are you? The Tasmanian Devil is my new best friend. Uh. He had him to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying hi, <laughs> and Tan Devil talk. I had to pick this guy up when I was there. I couldn't resist him. Anyway. So um, it was a really wonderful trip, and I'll be talking about that research. Um, so what I want to do is to, um, the call of the osprey is in the series called The uh, Scientists in the Field. So the Tasmanian Devil 
is um, a book an animal that has so people are sort of accepting it and then it's part of their the ecology of Tasmania and then this horrible facial tumor disease came along it's been killing them off um, and so that's what I went to, uh, the book is going to focus on the tumor disease and all the research around it as well as the the life of the Tasmanian devil but first off um, what do I do if I have a book idea I have to decide what age level is this idea appropriate for and for very young readers, a book like, this is my minute, is this the right? There we go. The books have to have lots of visuals and be a you know, simple topic, nothing too complicated for the little guys. And you can see that the text is also limited. Um, and there's always, every page has beautiful art these days in these kinds of, in these kinds of books. Um, an artist in Missoula named Kendall Jan Jubb and I did about half a dozen different books. We did Butterfly, the first one was called Flashy Fantastic Rainforest Frogs. And I have my husband Greg here to thank for that title. And then we did Sleeky, Scaly, Slithery Snakes. And I think that book's gone and we had one copy of that one. Um, I have some of the butterfly books. Uh, we did about half a dozen different, we did on coral reefs and other topics. But where there's a basic topic and you're just giving information and showing beautiful illustrations of that uh, kind of book. They can also be illustrated with photos, some of them. This is from a series of books I'm called uh, Early Bird Nature Books, where they're for early readers. So they're like for, for five to seven year olds. And I have a few of those here, um, llamas and something else um, that from that series of books. So. Next would be books of ages 8 to, to, to 12, 10 or 12, like this book on prairie dogs that I did. Um, or for um, ages 9 and up, you know, they're different. Some times they'll sell age to 12, sometimes they'll say 9 and up. Then there are books for ages 10 to 12 or 12 and up. Many, many of my books are on that age level, such as this one, Animals on the Trail with Lewis and Clark. And this was a lot of fun to do. My, my photographer, Bill Munoz, that I've worked with on a lot of my books, he, he travels to art fairs all over the place. And he was on his way. He was, he was listening to Undaunted Courage um, as an audio book in, his, in the car and was so inspired by it. And he realized the bicentennial was coming up of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So he said, we got to do some books about that. So we ended up doing like three different books, Animals on the Trail and Plants on the Trail. Um, particularly because I'm a biologist, right? So um, I wanted to talk about the kinds of plants that they found along the way and what, that, what they indicated and how the plants might be used and how they prepared the plants and stuff, and then animals on the trail. Some interesting things about the animals, for example, when they spent up with coyotes on the prairie, they were living in groups of like 50, and 50, and they had <coughs> burrows right by the game trails, and they were very, um, vociferous, you know, nowadays coyotes mostly, you're lucky if you see one, you know, but they, we, there was such a campaign against them by, by ranchers and so forth over time that they uh, have, uh, it's only the ones that are solitary and very, very sly and suspicious that um, have survived, so the pet behavior of these animals has changed. So that was, that was a lot of fun to be doing, um, doing that kind of, of writing. So sometimes you have to think about um, the age range of the, of the books. And uh, this, whether they're, I, when the Osama bin Laden raid happened, um, everybody got excited because there was a dog in the, on the team. And everybody wanted to know more about this dog. And they started showing slideshows on the internet and writing articles and papers and magazines and everything all about the um, dog, military working dogs. My next door neighbor, Kathy Cross, kept sending me links to all this stuff. And finally she said, why don't you write a book about this for kids? And I thought, well, I know kids and, and you know, I think about war as a, such a, a disheartening thing. And I really didn't want to make it, write a book for ages eight to 12 about that. So I talked to my editor, Emily, and she was excited about the idea. But when I said 10 and up, she said, well, you'll have to find another publisher because we only want to do books for eight to 12. So then I had to think about it and think, y'all, well, okay, um, how could I do that? And I finally decided, well, the important thing about these animals is dogs save lives. And so that was my focus. And with that focus, I was able to, um, to do the book for, for ages 8 to 12. 
and it really did quite well, and it got um, a number of awards, but my favorite awards was from the Michigan Library Association called the Mitten Award, because that was that's an award for doing the best job of communicating with your audience. And that was my concern with that book, was how to communicate this subject to eight to 12 year olds. So that was um, really, really made me feel good. So oh, the one last kind of book is um, uh, where you have two different age levels, uh, and levels of text in the book. This book about the return of the wolf to Yellowstone, I have a, like one sentence on the one side and then a more information on the other side for, for older readers. And actually a lot of teachers use this book because they say, okay, the, the shorter piece, a uh, simple sentence is like the copic sentence for a paragraph and the rest of it is like the rest of the paragraph. And then for Camus and Sage, what I did, I don't know if anybody else has ever done a book like this, but it was my, my idea. And um, it's a fiction story about a bison calf growing up on the prairie, something like it. You'd read to a five or six year old about this calf and how it's born and how it grows up and the experiences it has and so forth. And then it has sidebars um, in it about different aspects of, of life on the prairie and specifically about, about bison life. So, um, okay, I think that's enough general information um, about the kinds of age levels and the sorts of things one can, one can do. I don't know, is anybody in here somebody who's interested in writing uh, books for kids? Okay, so I won't go any further into that. Okay, so then I have, once I get an idea, um, I think I, I, just, I have to decide to I convince an edit, a publisher to publish the book, an editor to want the book, and a publisher to publish it. But once that happens, then what are my sources for my writing? Well, there's always um, maybe some books on a subject. Um, there are secondary <coughs> sources. But if you're writing science books, you know, there's articles about the topic, scientific papers. Of course, now we have so many internet sources. And you have to be careful, of course, with the internet about what you believe and what you don't, but I found the very best sources for information are the scientists and other people that are involved in the research. So that's one thing I love about this series, the scientists in the field, because they focus on the um, actual scientists and what they do. And The Call of the Osprey um, was written as my first book in that series. There are a lot of books, this, is only a, this shows a sort of a, a peek at some of the titles in the series. You notice the call of the ospreys <coughs> down in the far corner there. But there's about a couple dozen books, and all of them are about a particular scientific study that involves something, animals from the field, or, or like one of, there's one about volcanoes, so the scientists go out and study the volcanoes. And um, I had a, <coughs> really had a lot of fun working on that, on that book. And the book focuses on a project at the University of Montana from Eric Green and Heiko Langer and Rob Dominich measuring the heavy metal content of the blood of osprey chicks. So you think, well, what's that all about? Well, the heavy metals come from the big Superfund site here, right here in Butte, and they get in the, got in the river, and so these ospreys eat pretty much only fish. So like 99% of their diet is fish, so, and, a, and the male does the hunting, and he hunts within a mile or two of his nest. So, they can figure out the, by, by studying the, the, high, the metals in the blood of the chicks, they can see how bad that section of the river is in terms of the pollution um, from, these, from the heavy metals. So um, another good thing about this, this there's a, the cover of the book again, and they have two of the nests have webcams on them. And so that's really fun to watch these webcams. They're open to the, available to the public. Anybody can watch them. So I watched the webcams and I recorded um, my observations. And so they have my notebooks in the book. And then are some you know, excerpts from my notebooks. And then they also want the scientists to be shown to be human beings, not just guys in white lab coats you know, or in front of classrooms. And so um, they, um, they feature, they, they had, I had a little write-up of the, of the lives off, out of the lab of these guys. So, um, so anyway, working on this book, 
there's another, uh, this is later in the season, I just love this photo, I mean, this is from the webcam, and you can't, you know, it's so intimate, the parent is feeding the chicks from that lovely fish there, and the birds, of course, have no idea that anybody's watching what they're doing, so you can just watch them, and one of the webcams actually has a night camera now, so you can actually see the, the animals um, at night. So I also, um, I spent time when Eric took a group of school kids and was giving them information about the ospreys, I went along so I was able to describe the ospreys' lifestyle in Eric's voice as he's tell, telling kids about it, which is what they really like in the series. And then I went and joined them on their, on their field trips to uh, get chicks out of the nest and sample the blood. And uh, it was really, really a lot of fun doing that, that um, work. So you can sort of see how broad the scope of one of these books can be. There's the webcams, there's the, the life has history, there's this particular study, there's the results of the study, there's what, how these, these, machine, these gadgets in the lab that are used to diagnose the, um, you know, to measure the levels of the different heavy metals. So anyway, so in March of 2015, an old friend of mine from my student days at Berkeley Australian geneticist Jenny Marshall Graves visited us in California where we were escaping from the winter. And I had heard about the Tasmanian devil and this, uh, this, this disease that had started showing up in the late 90s in the, in the wild animals. And uh, I, I, avoided, I avoided learning about it because it just sounded so horrible that they get these tumors on their faces and they die of starvation and you don't know how much pain they're in either at the time. It's really a horrible, horrible disease. And it, it seemed to be 100% fatal. The animals were being decimated all across Tasmania. And they, they were afraid that, that the devils were gonna be wiped out. And the question was, you know, how does this, what is this disease? And where did it come from? And so they tried to say, a virus? No, it isn't a virus. It is a bacterium? No, it's not a bacterium. What the heck is it? It's killing off these animals like crazy. Well, Jenny, she's a geneticist, a very prominent, highly respected geneticist. And so another scientist um, called her and said, I have these images of the chromosomes from various tumors, the tumors of various uh, devils, and I'd like to show them to you. So she brought them over and Jenny looked at these slides and she saw, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This, the chromosomes from all these different animals, tumors, are identical. So the only possible answer is that this is a transmissible tumor. Actual Tasmanian devil cells from one animal mutated back in, in the 90s and started growing, you know, with the cancer in that particular animal and then other animals caught it somehow from that animal and their bodies didn't recognize this, these cells as other devil cells but they differ from a different animal you know if you have a transplant you know you've got to take all kinds of immunosuppressive drugs so you don't reject that other person's organ but these poor animals are completely susceptible to this they they're, they're don't uh, they don't recognize the, the cells and so they die from it so this is something, there was only one other case, a very rare in, uh, infection uh, case in dogs where there's a tumor, uh, a, the uterus of female dogs. That's the only other <coughs> example at the time that was known. So I thought, wow, you know, this is something, a great mystery. You know, how did they solve this mystery of what the, what the tumor is? And then what did they do about it? What are the implications now that we know it's a transmissible tumor that spreads through biting? Um, they found out that the, the cell type is a Schwann cell, which is the cells that coat the nerves of you know anatomy. They, Schwann cells form a sheath around the nerves in your body and protect them from, you know, from, keep the electricity from you know, going the wrong way, whatever. Um, and uh, so, so that's a very unusual cell in people. You hardly ever have a Schwann cell tumor. So it's a very strange thing. Um, so they, they know it was a female because of the cells. They looked at the chromosomes, the cell chromosomes were all female, you know, from a female animal, these cells. Now the next slide I'm gonna show you very quickly because it's a picture of an animal that's suffering from this tumor, these tumors, and it's pretty gory and horrible. So if you wanna close your eyes or look away, I'm only gonna show it for a few seconds. 
It's really awful. These guys are lucky. <laughs> they're in captivity. They're not going to get this horrible disease. Um, and this is this. There's a number of what they have done now is uh, to. My next qu the questions came in my mind then. You know, how are they trying to keep these devils from getting extinct? Jenny answers. They have insurance populations on the mainland. They've captured animals from areas where the disease hadn't spread yet, taken them to the mainland where they're safe from the disease. And then I think, well, how can we keep, the, they keep these animals wild enough? And what other fascinating things are scientists learning about the devils now that there's so much concern about saving them? You know, is there any hope for the species in the wild? And uh, Jenny says, well, one group is working on a vaccine, but both Jenny and I are skeptical. You know, how do you create a vaccine against a type of cell that's a flawed cell of a normal cell in the body? If you, if, if you get the immune system to fight Schwann cells, for example, that's no good because it's going to dis destroy the nervous system. So we both, both were wondering about that. You know, how are they going to, how are they doing this? So when I want to know the answers for myself, as much as I want to write them for other people, I know this is a project I really want to pursue. So besides Greg and I have always wanted to go to Australia, now we had an excuse. <laughs> so that was a part of it as well. But uh, I was really interested in so many different aspects to this, to this, whole, this whole study. So uh, it took a while to get final approval from the, pu to the, from the publisher. This, the ed editor for this series is named Erica, and she really liked the idea. So meanwhile, I started looking for source material. And there's the one book that came out in 2005 that's written by a couple of respected scientists um, and numerous scientific papers. But of course, the primary sources are the people who know the animals and the people who care for them in captivity. So how was I going to see, find out who the most important people were and, and make arrangements to see them? Luckily for me, Jenny, my friend, she knows most of these people personally because she's a geneticist and she's highly uh, respected. She's won a whole bunch of awards in Argentina, and not Argentina, in Australia, for her for her scientific endeavors, and she's she's just this amazing uh, person. So um, so she knows all these these people, and she lives not far from a zoo that has a devil preservation and breeding program. One of these. Um, mainland of Australia, uh, uh, insure what they call insurance populations uh, for the devils. <laughs> so she gave me a list of contacts and she made introductions for me and because of her, who she is and her respect that she has, I didn't have any problem. Everybody wanted, was so helpful and open, giving me their time and their energy and um, I was just really delighted to um, have their time and their, their expertise. So I never had as, com as uh, complex a planning ch challenge as I did for this book. Here I was traveling halfway around the world where I get to need to be sure to visit all the right people and the institutions and get the information I needed and get out in the field somehow with somebody because after all it is scientists in the field, right? Um, so, and I wasn't going to have a photographer for this project. Uh, for, the, for many of my books, including the Osprey book, I worked with Bill Munoz. So, um, but this is a, a story that mostly has pictures from the researchers and th things that happened in the past and are ongoing um, in their labs and so forth. But I've taken done enough, uh, so a lot of my books have some of my pictures in them. And um, so I figured, well, I can just fill in for the, what we need for my own experiences. I can take the pictures that I'll need and then um, I can fill in for you know, what they, I can't get from the experts. They've all been very, very generous about they say, just let me know what you want and I'll send it to you. And so since we were going so far away, we also planned to visit other parts of Australia. And um, we put those, those visits in before the trip to Tasmania, partly because Tasmania is, you have to think backwards there. Tasmania is far to the south, okay? And it's spring now there. And we're going into fall, they're going into spring. And in the south, it's like being in the north here. So spring comes later in Canada than it does in Montana. Um, so we wanted to go to Tasmania at the end of the trip because the weather was going to be you know, warmer and uh, better at that, at that time. 
So we landed in Sydney, where Greg has friends and relatives, and we got adapted to the time zones and enjoyed the area around Queensland and, and as well, and the tropical rainforest, Great Barrier Reef. Then we flew to Melbourne, where Jenny lives in that, in that area, and we stayed with them when we visited Healesville Sanctuary, which is this um, place where they have the, some of the animals that are in the insurance population. So there, they're trying to keep these animals as unexposed to people as possible. The theory being, you know, if they're going to be introduced in the wild, that taken back, or if they're going to have, have the offspring that will be introduced into the wild, we don't want them used to people. We want them to be wild, as wild as they can be in captivity. So they worked very hard there to create these, they have these pens and full lots of vegetation, and they're like seven pens, and they never actually, they try to keep them from even seeing any people. They bring the food in a truck and they, they leave it for the animals. Um, periodically they have to weigh them and, and take some other measurements perhaps, but they're, they're, they do their very best to keep them uh, <coughs> away from people and in a wild environment so that if these animals are released or their offspring they raise or release, they will know what it's like, you know, how to behave in the wild. And they do um, very careful breeding to keep the genetics as diverse as they can. Um, they'll put a male and a female in pens next to each other and then see how they, if they get along or not, and then they'll um, breed them together. So they've raised a lot of animals there, as you'll, you'll see. Um, so here's a close-up of the water setup they have for the animals. I guess it looks like water catchment, and then they can drink out of the bowl. But each animal is in its own area. The, the Tasmanian devil is basically a solitary animal. It doesn't, they don't hunt in packs like dogs or anything. They're mostly scavengers, uh, but they also can, can kill. They're very good hunters as well. But it's always an individual hunt. They never cooperate, apparently, with each other in hunting. So, so they're pretty much a solitary animal, like a wolverine is in, in uh, North America. So um, after we visited the, oh, they also talked to the, one of the keepers there. He talked about the whole breeding cycle and how they work with the animals and how they keep track of this and that. And they have TVs. There's, if you look closely at this picture, I don't know if you can see it, but right about in the middle, there's a little touch of orange color, right at pretty much in the middle of the picture. Um, and that's a camera. So they, they have a motion, cam motion active camera in there in the pen so they can see what the animals are up to, especially when they're uh, trying to see if they're about breeding. And then they have um, a, a room with, um, with TV screens with, for uh, the, uh, the dens for the animals. And there was one den that had a female and young while we were there, so we got to watch the, the female and her, her young inside the den interacting. So they really keep close track of these animals, but from a distance as much as possible so that they don't interact with people. So after we toured that area, we just then we did a whole trip around the, the whole zoo and saw lots of Australian animals. And they have one display that has a male uh, devil. You can see him peeking out from his den here. But the males, you have to, they have to keep separate because they don't get along with each other very well. The females, on the other hand, do quite well in, in a group situation. So they have three females. Um, these are these two, in, in this enclosure. One of them we didn't see that much of, but this is Tierney and Sassafras are the names of these two girls. And they're very curious. You come up, if when they see you coming up to the pen, they immediately come, come up to, towards the front and they, they sniff, 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 sniff. You can see these long whiskers they have. They're, they have more whiskers, I think, than any other creature I've ever seen. The whiskers are, are you know, like this big around their faces and they're very, um, very curious. And then they have those two, two uh, canines that are pretty impressive teeth, that's what they use for crunching bone. So this is just part of the display they have of all the identification tags for the different devils they've had at Fieldsville, this is at this sanctuary, over the years uh, since they started. And they have over 100 of these. And the, the black marks are the white marks okay, on the animals. The animals are all black. So what they've done is to reverse black and white. And you can see that each animal has a very different pattern of of white markings. So this is probably one of the ways they, they identify each other is by, by the markings. I, would, I don't know if anybody's actually studied that aspect. It'd be pretty hard to, hard to, to study. Um, 
but each one is a name and then they show the markings so they can, they can keep track of them. So after that visit, then it was, we did some other touring around the area and Melbourne, but then it was off to Tasmania. And uh, Greg, Greg, of course, came along and Jenny and her husband, John, and their 11-year-old grandson, Felix, who was so great to have along. He's, the, he's the 11 years, that's the age level of the book hunt, you know, writing. And just a great kid, really, really interested in how things work, interested in learning new stuff, and a lot of knowledge about a lot of things that was always we talk, talking about something and Felix would have the information. I and mean, he's really, really great having him along with us. So Tasmania reminds me a lot of Montana. Um, it's about a fifth the size of Montana, so it's not a very, not actually a very big island. You can drive from one end to the other in, in uh, maybe three hours. Um, if you go on the main main highway around one side, but we went through the center of the island when we flew when we drove. So this is, but this is a uh, right, you know, rugged mountains, and they also have a lot of of uh, pastoral pa uh, farms and so forth. A lot of farming goes on. The people there are very interested in, as we are here in Montana, in, in uh, self being self sustainable. You know, we want to have eat food raised in Montana when we can. And they're that way about Tasmania. They have a lot of farms of all kinds of different things. And of course, they can they can uh, grow a lot of. They can even grow citrus there. It's actually people think of it as being so far south, but apparently they're actually closer to the equator than uh, many of uh, major U.S. cities like Chicago and some of the other Midwestern cities. So, um, and there's only two. There's only two cities of any size: one, Seston, which is in the north, and then Hobart, which is down in the south, where the university is. And their university apparently had Hobart has a sister relationship of some sort with the University of Montana. So there's a connection. I just found out about that last night from a friend. Anyway, so we really love Tasmania. It is so beautiful, and most of it is very, very wild, although there is a lot of, of, uh, of tamed um, countryside. So our first visit um, was with a woman named Rebecca Cuthill in Launceston. We flew into Launceston in the north. And she's the manager of the Save the Devil Appeal, which is a very effective, efficient organization that has a presence just about everywhere on the island. This is what greeted us at the airport, in making contributions to the Save the Devil campaign with this rather crazed looking uh, plastic, or I'm not sure what he's made of, uh, devil. So I gave him 10, 10 Australian dollars happily um, for the campaign. Um, then there are flyers everywhere, and they use this black background with the red and the white type everywhere, so you really get becomes uh, attached really to the devil, save the devil campaign. They're very proud of this animal all over the the country, and it's become this their official their official animal. At the state of Tasmania, Australia is divided into states, but they're only like half a dozen states, I think, altogether. So Tasmania is its own political entity. So Rebecca was very helpful, and she explained to me that there are a number of different entities involved in this effort. The University of Tasmania, where many researchers are involved. Then there's the medical school, which is on the other side of, of, um, of Hobart from where the university is. And that's where Greg Woods and his crew are working on developing a vaccine. And then the Tasmanian government, where David Pemberton <coughs> is, is the man who directs the overall program, and he's in a government office. So all these entities and the people are supposed to work together um, and cooperate uh, with one another and not step on each other's toes. But as I'm sure you all are aware, that isn't always the way it is. Um, and of, of course, Rebecca expressed pride at how well they all work together and so forth. But um, it's not always completely the case. For example, sometimes I'd be, Jenny knew I was going to be interv interviewing a particular person, and she'd say, well, be careful. When you're talking to that person, be careful you don't praise this other person because this one doesn't, you know, <laughs> has issues <laughs> with this other person and that person's work. Um, so it gets to be very complicated as, uh, in terms, as you'll see, when you see what the different, the different things that are going on, I think they're leading to some interesting clashes coming up. So next on our agenda was a park that's Naro, Narawan Tapu. Always had trouble. It's N A R A W N T A P U, Narawantapu National Park, where they have released a number of devils that have have 
been given this experimental vaccine. And there are also still wild devils there. So um, while we were hiking through, I, was, I did my best to stay ahead of the others um, because I wanted to experience it myself you know, uh, anew because I had never been in this environment. And it's very different. The two plant families, tree families there, are mainly acacias and eucalyptus, many, many different species of acacias and eucalyptus. And in California, where I grew up, there's a lot, of, a lot of eucalyptus, which of course came from Australia, but it loves that climate, the Mediterranean sort of climate. That's kind of what Tasmania and a lot of Australia um, has that kind of climate. The, the southern, uh, well, the more areas of the country, which of course are the cooler areas, because they're close to they're on the other side of the world. Have, have, but even in Tasmania, you can grow citrus. They have uh, lemon trees down there, at least. So um, I've never seen forests like, like this. This is mostly the eucalyptus. And they, see, this is in the water that we had. A, they had a lot of rain just before we came. And I'm not sure. I think this is probably a very moist area, generally speaking. I don't know if they always have standing water there, but it looks pretty swampy. And then um, this is just another picture showing you see the probably several different kinds of eucalyptus there. And some of the acacias, the only acacias I'd ever seen before were small, bushy things, the bushy plants in California. And I've seen pictures of acacias in Africa, which are all bushies, bushy. Um, in Australia, some of the acacias are gigantic, tall, tall trees that they use for, for, uh, for timber. So at every turn of the path, I was hoping to see, of course, a devil. But I knew that I wasn't likely to, because it was they're mainly active from uh, uh, at night, especially from dusk and dusk to dawn. And most of the wildlife in Australia is active at night, which is kind of disappointing. You know, we're so lucky to go to Yellowstone and watch the, see the bison and the elk and all those animals in the daytime. But the, in Australia, almost all the animals are are active at, at night. I think because the hard daytime can be so harsh um, down there. So anyway, there were some animals though, like this kangaroo in the in the brush and um, wallabies grazing. You see, this is a mother wallaby. You see her uh, Joey peeking out from uh, under under her there. I thought that was took a lot of pictures of the, of this, and I only found the one where you could actually tell that the lump under her was a Joey. And then there's this other animal called a paddy melon. Nobody knows where that word comes from, P-A-D-E-M-E-L-O-N, um, which is uh, darker fur and smaller tail and shyer than the other, the other animals. Um, the other, the, uh, pat, the, the uh, wallabies are actually very, they're like our deer, you know. I don't, you probably have deer here like we do in Missoula. They just come into your yard and they start munching on stuff. And, without being scared. And that's kind of what the, the, the uh, wallabies are like in Australia. So um, the weather, we were lucky to avoid the rather iffy weather. And then after this visit, we went to Trowuna. Tro <coughs> we left there. By the time we left, it was dark. And all over the uh, island, there are signs like this, especially in areas where they've released the animals um, to watch out for the, the Tasmanian devils um, on the road. So the next stop was this wildlife park named Chawana. And uh, it's home of a lot of Australian uh, wildlife. They have a gigantic statue of a, of a devil uh, right at the street where you turn to go into the park. These are the kangaroos. Um, this is what kangaroos do in the daytime if they're out and about. They just lie around. They, this, they were doing the same thing in another park where another little zoo we went to uh, up in Queensland. The kangaroos were just, they're just lying around. That's what they do, um, taking their naps in the daytime. Um, this is really a wonderful, uh, wonderful wildlife park. Um, and he, um, Andrew, the guy who runs it, he spells his name A-N-D-R-O-O. And I don't know whether it was given to him that way or whether it's his feeling of identity with the wildlife that made him uh, change, his, change his name. But he's really into the devils especially. Even his dog is, shaped, is colored like a devil. I couldn't believe it. He came into the, into the little shop and there was the dog. And I thought, my goodness, that's like a giant devil with the black and the white markings on it. Um, 
so we really learned a, learned a lot about the devils there and got to see a lot of them and uh, got a great photo op. Um, well, here's some of the devils. There's a whole, the young ones get along well with each other. Um, so these are, these are kids. They have a breeding program there too. And this is actually um, on, the, on the island. Um, so they now realize that they can, can um, have safe populations on the island even though that's where the disease is. So there's several uh, uh, insurance populations also on Tasmania itself. So we got a great photo op also. That's me holding a six month old um, devil. You could tell I was enjoying that great special treat. And here's Jenny, my dear friend and amazing woman colleague, uh, getting to hold the devil also. So then we went down through the center of the island across that of the highway that goes by those rocks we saw. There was even some snow. And uh, uh, Felix went crazy over the snow because he'd only seen snow once before in his life. So he had to stop and he had a snowball fight with his uh, grandfather. It was, that was really fun. Um, so the next thing was uh, I had a meeting with David Pemberton, who's manager of the Save the Devil program, his office in this government building. So he gives us a big, really good overview of the program, his hopes for the vaccine, uh, which the program supports heavily. He's also concerned about the survival of animals released from the insurance population. They've been released into some of the couple areas that are disease free and very hard for devils to get in and out of so that the, they're not worried about the sick devils getting in. Um, but they're very prone to becoming roadkill. So despite all these efforts to keep them wild like they're doing at Healesville, they have learned because trucks bring their food. So when they hear the sound of a truck, Oh, good. Truck equals good. Brings my food. So they're, they're released into the wild. They come to the road and they hear, this, you know, they hear the sounds of vehicles. Oh, vehicles. Good. My food. And of course, there's ro roadkill. A lot of their roads are very narrow and windy and don't have shoulder or much of the shoulders. There's a lot of roadkill. You see kangaroos and paddy melons and, and wombats and other animal bodies by the roadside. Well, that's perfect devil food. So, like they released 10 animals in, uh, um, in uh, Narawantapu, and uh, within a few weeks, uh, three of them had become roadkill. So, that's a real problem. Um, so, the folks at Healesville were also very proud that their animals had passed tests to show that they were uncomfortable around human things. They had this whole series of tests that they gave them, and they didn't know if it was okay for me to write about these tests, that maybe they were something something private and secret. Um, so they said, well, ask David Pemberton about it. So I asked David Pemberton about it. He said, oh, we don't use those tests anymore. <laughs> so you're beginning to see how, how talking to all these different people about this, this subject from their different viewpoints and their different positions and their different knowledge base, I'm getting a much more complicated picture. You know, I'm finding that um, you know, not only that it isn't just the devils are dying out, we've got these insurance populations, we're going to wait till they all die out, and then we're going to reintroduce devils to the island. Very simple. It's not like that at all. It's much more complicated. They're already releasing some animals, and uh, they're finding out that, that um, you know, this, this attempt to keep them free of human influence is not necessarily working the way that they, they might like. So I also found out from from uh, David, he calls himself Doozy, is his nickname, from Doozy, that uh, the program is now focusing on using devils from uh, a location called Mariah Island, where they've, been re they've released devils and the devils are doing very well. There's no vehicle traffic. There is actually a truck that belongs to the, apparently we saw a truck going around, but it's, it's just for the wildlife service. There's no roads, uh, no cars allowed, no trucks, you know, no public transportation allowed on the island. There's no real roads at all, so there's no problem with roadkill on, on Mariah Island. Um, so, so now they're gonna use that as a source. So anyway, so we went to Mariah Island, and the next day, Greg and, uh, and um, Jenny and I, Felix and John had already left and gone back home. So, so we went, and we didn't see any devils, as was expected, because um, they're, you know, we were there in the daytime, it was the only time we could be there, is they, people can go and camp and spend the night. Uh, some, there's also 
it was a prison there, and there are rooms that were prison, part of the prison where people can stay overnight, but somehow that just didn't appeal to us. So I didn't have the time anyway. But this is probably, this, this could be a devil den. They like to have a burrow in, under the uh, into dens, and they also will take over uh, wombat <coughs> burrows. Wombats dig, are really good digging animals, and they make their own burrows. And sometimes the devils will take over an old wombat burrow. So this could very well be the burrow of, of the devil. So we did see, didn't see any, any, um, any devils. We didn't even see kangaroos there. I was surprised we didn't see any kangaroos or wallabies. They have a lot of different animals there, but they were all out of sight, except for the wombats. We saw a lot of wombats, including this mommy and her little one. So that was kind of a special treat to see to see these wombats. Well, then um, the weather was getting bad, so we went into the into the visitor center, and they were showing a. a video called Aussie Animal Island. And it's a sweet story about a, one of the, a carer, one of the, with the people who takes care of the, the um, uh, devils in need. And she had raised three baby devils um, that the mother was, was roadkill, but the babies had, had survived in the pouch. And these animals are marsupials, like kangaroos, and they raise the babies in, the, in a pouch on their, on their belly. So, uh, the baby survived, so she raised these three babies, and two of them were released on Mariah Island. And they went when the researchers went and did a trapping. They found one of these um, these animals had made it and had babies. So I'm thinking, well, these babies were raised by a person, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, so much again for trying to keep them as wild as possible. You know, they get out there, they know how to, they figure it out. And that's what Andrew had said. He said he didn't think much of the whole business of trying to raise them to be wild. So, so that was interesting. And then uh, I spent a day with Greg Woods, who's the, the um, guy who does the, um, the, he's head of the lab that does the vaccine work. And he talked about that. We got to see the two vets uh, taking blood from a couple of captive animals. And what they do is they put them in a, they, they take them, trap them, and they put them in a, gun, in a burlap bag, and then they're uh, anesthetizing them so that they can take the blood. And this is a picture of the mouth of the devil. And if you look really closely, you can see the color of the tooth, the canine there, is a little bit different at the root of it. And that's because they, they, the canines grow over time, unlike our teeth. They grow over time, and they often are, are broken when the animals are, are grunch crunching bone. They often break their teeth. So it's one of this, it's they've evolved these teeth that will, um, that will grow. So I also visited the lab and got to see the cells of the tumors growing. Turns out there's a second tumor now that's uh, from a male devil in another part of the island, which complicates things even further. So my field trip was in the countryside with a wonderful gal named Alexandra, uh, and she was a, she's a graduate student at Washington State University. So she sets a couple dozen traps, um, and then it goes and checks them every day. This, this is the kind of the traps are these plastic tubes, and they have, well, of course the that one has a devil in it because it's closed. The entrance is closed, so she she looks in, the, in and sees what, what's in there. Sometimes there's another animal called a qual. They, they, they bait with, with rotting meat, so it's pretty, you know, you don't want to get too close to bait. Um, the quals are small animals. They're sort of like a fisher or marten in size, and they, um, they also are scavengers like the devils. So anyway, so it was great to watch her work with the devils. She checks them to see if they have any tumors on their faces. And every, all the work is done in the bed. She never takes them out of the burlap until she's ready to let them go. But they don't, they, they just keep them, they don't anesthetize these wild, the wild ones. They just work with them in the burlap bag and they just sort of go limp. So they're very easy to work with. And then she takes measurements like she measures the teeth and other things. She takes blood sample and um, then she releases them into the wild. And they're doing very sophisticated genetic work at Washington State University in Pullman. So I'm going to follow through with, uh, with Alexandra and visit her after she gets back from Tasmania in May in her lab there. So um, as you can see, 
there are lots of people working on trying to understand these animals. And uh, so much has been learned in a year and a half uh, since Jenny talked to me in California. So there are all these different viewpoints, you know. What, is the, what about releasing these animals that had the vaccine into the wild? It turns out that there's a new paper um, by another scientist named Meta Jones, who's been working with these animals since before the disease came along. And they've been finding that even in the area where the devils, the disease started, there's still devils. So maybe there's some natural resistance. Maybe the disease isn't going to kill every, every wild devil. Maybe they're evolving. Maybe they already had some animals with natural resistance. Maybe, maybe, all kinds of possible, possible things. So it's just really fascinating and really complicated. And um, so it's a whole paradigm shift, you know, for these people who've been thinking that this is going to, there's going to be a wipeout. Uh, they need to have more evidence, of course, because this is just the first paper that's come out suggesting that, that there might be some resistance um, out there. So it's not surprising um, that visiting all these locations and all these different passionate people um, is really important if you're doing any kind of research. You know, you want to talk to the guys who are doing something else that's related to what you're doing, or whether you're, that's as a scientist, or whether you're, you know, wanting to write about something. So it'll be interesting. Luckily, it's a quite a bit of time before the book comes out. They have a whole schedule into the future and it won't be actually published until January 2019. So I can follow through with these scientists. I got the basic information, they know who I am, I'll keep in touch with them by email and see what they're doing and I'll be able to visit Alex uh, personally, which is really gonna be, gonna be fun. So, this little guy is saying, and me, how about me? They're just really, really fun animals. They're, um, we became quite fond of them, Greg especially, he's become a total devil, devil nut. So anyway, I don't know if anybody has any, any questions or comments. Yes? Yeah, they, they look both cute and intimidating at the same time, I mean, if you look at those teeth. What are they really like, okay? Would you go up to one and, and try to pet it on its head, a wild one? No, they, well, not a wild, wild one probably would, wouldn't want to get close, but even one of these guys, they do, they, they're very, they, they like to bite. And even that little, <laughs> the little one, you know, the six, six, six months old one, um, it was one of a, another, well, actually, there's Andrew and then there's Drew, whose name is also Andrew, and Drew was showing us, he took the, the, the young one for us to put, be photographed with. And he said, no, be really careful with it, you know, hold it, this is how you should hold it. And it doesn't like this, and it doesn't like that, you know, it might bite. <laughs> you know, this is this baby, it might bite. Um, and of course the biting is the downfall of these animals because that's how the tumor, what happens is the biter, apparently, is the one who gets the tumor. If it bites an animal with the tumor, then the cells from the tumor get on, in its, on its mouth and infect its mouth. And like I say, they, there's no recognition of this. Now, uh, this, this um, Greg Woods explained about the, the, the vaccine and how it works, and it's very, it has to do with um, epigenetics, and I've, I've got to study some epigenetics, because I, I studied a lot of genetics when I was a, uh, a student, but that was a long time ago, you know, and this whole epigenetics is such a big thing now, um, and it involves, the vaccine involves getting the cell, the, the tumor cells to reveal their, their malignancy and then that's what the, the uh, immune cells are able to then detect that malignancy and attack the cells. So I need to learn a lot before, before I can even explain it properly to, to anybody else. But that seems to be what, what they're doing. So this way it's not identifying a Schwann cell, it's identifying just the, the malignant aspect of the cell. So it's very clever. Yes. So I just, I'm teaching actually the, about the studying and the in my restoration classes oh. because restoring kind of a species. And last year I didn't know that, but just a couple of months ago there was a science paper coming out that said that there is actually resistance building up in the devils. So that's yeah. kind of a new for just in the last mm -hmm. and I brought it to class and. Uh, so the, they're they're investigating the genetics of it, and I, as I understood, they're changing. They're really quickly adopting, a, kind of building up that resistance. Yeah. Well, I talked. I didn't 
talk too much about Mena, but we spent a lot of time with, with her. We had a, I, we chatted with her, and then she actually invited us over for lunch one day, and we spent a lot of time with her. But she pointed out that you know you get this tumor, you die. So the evolution, the pressure, the evolutionary pressure is really heavy on the on the animals to have you know if they develop some kind of resistance, and it may even just be that they're that they're animals that are resistant enough. They're, 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 they only live five or six years. They breed for, uh, for like, when they're one year old, two years old, three years old. So um, if they can breed, say the, the female gets bitten during the, this apparently the, it's the sexual relations are, are pretty, pretty awful. The, the males uh, sequester the female and they bite her a lot. Um, and uh, so she maybe bites back in the process of courtship. I'm not, I don't know the details exactly at this point of that. I haven't read the, the details, but so I have a lot to learn myself from you know, what's been written. I know what people have told me, because uh, I need that this was when I was going to Australia. So anyway, um, maybe they young, they take some, it takes six months for the disease to kill an animal. So say the female gets, in, gets infected during the mating season and She's raised, she has babies in her pouch. Maybe the babies get far enough along that they, they uh, can live on their own before she dies. So even if she, she's not, you know, the, the period of time that the animal's suffering from the disease, if, it, if it's long enough, the babies can survive and the population can continue to survive. Um, even though, you know, the mother dies, the babies go on to grow up and and they're finding their mating a little earlier, too, is another thing, too, that seems to be the case. But this is the paper I was mentioning, that Mena and her colleagues, and um, of course, at first, everybody's skeptical, because it's the first paper that's showing this, and it's, uh, but they did measure the, they did do genetic studies of animals before the disease, because she's been working on these things for 30 years. And so she had that data, thank goodness, uh, to compare with the recent data. And there have been definite changes in the genetics that, that, that seem to be uh, significant. Yes? Do they have any natural predators? No, not really, because okay. they're, the, they're the biggest thing around now. They, this, there was a Tasmanian tiger, which was a larger animal, but they, they went extinct because of human persecution. Huh. And so they're, they're all gone. Uh, there's some people that think that they, they want to think they're still around. They say, oh, they're out in the wild parts of Tasmania where people don't go. And they claim to have seen one, but there's never been any, any actual, you know, uh, feces found of a Tasmanian tiger or anything that would prove that they're actually out there. So this is it. This is the biggest thing going. And of course, there's a whole ecological, a lot of ecological issues. There actually were devils on the mainland of Australia 3,000 years ago, and there's a, some of the people we talked to favor the idea of reintroducing the Tasmanian devils into the mainland because feral cats, of course, which are not native, foxes, which have been introduced, which are not native, even the dingoes, not really native, are on the mainland. They have cats in Tasmania, and they're a big problem, but they don't have the foxes or the, or the dingoes there. But if they, they found that the the devils on Mariah Island are suppressing the cats, the, the feral cat activity. The feral cat. Yeah, so that's a good thing. You know, they're they're um, they're helping helping with the feral cats, and then there are also possums that have been starting to raid the bird colonies on, on and they have an endangered species, a bird on the Mariah Island, and the the possums were coming out of the trees before they introduced the devils there. And now the devils are suppressing the possums, which is helping the birds. I mean, these things get so complicated. It's really, I love this stuff. You know, the more complicated it gets, the more interesting it gets. So, so many different, different things to, to keep in mind. And of course, Tasmania doesn't want devils on. They identify now so strongly with the government. There's no way the government's going to let the mainland have this animal. You know, it's ours. <laughs> It's the Tasmanian devil, it's not the Australian devil. You know, they belong, all, all the animals actually belong, all the Tasmanian devils belong to the, to the uh, Tas to Tasmanian government, so. Anyway, so I guess we're a little after five, so. We are a little after five. Other... Um, what I wanted to do was not stop the conversation, but for those of you who need to um, keep to the time, 
Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to scurry out if you need to. Um, for those of you guys who want to keep the conversation going, please feel free to come on up, um, meet Dorothy, and um, check out the, some of her publications. We have and, nonfiction. Uh, yeah, the cards. Yeah, uh, and, and overall, just thank you very much. This is yes, this is fantastic. Okay.